Welcome back to another chapter in the world of procedural generation and infinite landscapes. In today's video we'll explore the next evolution of Infinite Horizons, the AI navigation system and how to use it, the restructured architecture of Infinite Horizons and the implementation of portals that connect entire worlds. And there is also a little surprise waiting at the end because I have an announcement to make. For those new here, Infinite Horizons is my costume Unreal Engine plugin designed to generate and manage nearly infinite worlds procedurally. If you haven't watched my previous devlog, I'll link it somewhere up here. We focused on terrain generation, foliage spawning and village creation. Since then the project has evolved massively, so I decided to restructure the whole system from the ground up making it more modular and ready to handle multiple worlds simultaneously. Let's start with the new architecture. The core idea behind Infinite Horizons is modularity. Each part of the world generation runs in its own manager class, which make use of multiple subclasses. To connect everything, I implemented subsystems that serve different purposes. But let's start with the Infinite Horizons core class. It serves as the core tool to generate worlds and initialize the required manager classes for this world. This is where all the generated world data, like the landscape data or village data, gets stored. When generating a world, it gets assigned a unique world ID. This ID can be used to find and access the data related to this world. I implemented logic to destroy copies of this core actor to make it exist only once per level. I could have used a world subsystem instead, but I think it's more convenient for other developers to place the actor in the level and to have all parameters in one place. Including the in-editor generation logic, which allows to pre-generate worlds in the editor, save the level and solely use it as a developer tool. This Infinite Horizons core class then delegates different generation tasks to the main manager classes. Currently there are three main managers. One for generating the landscape, one for spawning structures and another one for handling entities and navigation. Each manager handles different subclasses. For example, the landscape manager handles chunk actors, noise algorithms, foliage generation and a lot more. I've split up the world data into different data structs. So each manager only holds a reference to the required data, stored in the Infinite Horizons core. To send requests and comments between managers and their subclasses, I'm making use of the World Coordinator subsystem, which is a UWorld subsystem, so it exists only once per level and doesn't have to be placed or spawned. It's basically the backend of Infinite Horizons, acts like an interface and helps to avoid the usage of pointers between different classes. That's also where the Infinite Horizons core registers new manager classes which allows to control the lifecycle of manager classes of different worlds from one place. All I need to send a request from one manager to the other is the world ID to identify the correct manager class. For example, the structure manager wants to spawn a building and sends the request to flatten and adjust the terrain around it to the landscape manager using the world coordinator subsystem. On the other end, there is the access subsystem, handling the user and player input. It collects data from user interfaces and sends the generation requests to the plugin's core and handles player position and teleportation. I think it's important to say that instead of a UWorld subsystem, I'm using a game instance subsystem here because it only exists once per project or game. This allows to not only travel between generated worlds within the same level, but also keeps track of other Infinite Horizons core actors 
residing within completely different levels. This allows cross-level traveling. The next big step was AI navigation. Unreal Engine's built-in navigation system doesn't work for my infinite terrain, so I built my own solution by using a weight grid and a pathfinding system. I already use this system for the pathway algorithm in the village generation process, but adjusting it to allow frequent updates was not as forward as I expected. Since we are on a nearly infinite terrain, I use the same approach as Unreal Engine's navigation system for big landscapes and only calculate the navigation for a small area around the AI. Each entity, which can for example be an animal, an NPC or an enemy, requests the terrain data in a predefined radius around it from the landscape manager using the world coordinator subsystem and hands it to the pathfinding algorithm. This avoids long calculations and is way more memory friendly since I have to copy the data to avoid a lot of other issues. For the pathfinding I use an A star algorithm and here is how it works. To calculate the path between cells A and B we have to check a few values for the neighbors of the starting cell. What we need is a G cost, H cost and F cost. The G cost represents the distance from the starting cell to the current cell. In this example, imagine a cell being 10 by 10. So if we move a cell left, right, up or down, the distance is 10. And to keep it simple, we are using 14 for diagonals. The H cost tells us the distance to cell B. If we now add up those two values, we get the F cost which is basically the distance from cell A to cell B using this path. So what we want is not to check the entire grid, but only the cells with the lowest F cost to make sure the path is as efficient as possible. If we continue doing that, we'll see that we get the shortest path to the goal. Based on different terrain attributes, we now can determine the cells the AI is able to navigate on. This ensures the AI is moving around buildings, trees and avoids steeper slopes. It works the exact same way as in the previous example, but now we just skip cells that are marked as blocked. In code, this function starts by adding the starting cell to a checklist, then repeatedly sorts it to always process the cell with the lowest global goal, which is our F cost. For each neighbor, it skips blocked or too steep cells, updates the local and global goals if a shorter path is found, and continues until the destination is reached. Finally, it builds the path backwards from the goal by tracing each cell's parent. A new path is calculated every 0.5 seconds to ensure the entity is always up to date when chasing a moving goal like the player for example. To use the custom crafted navigation system, all developers have to do is to select the entity base as parent class instead of the character base class. And they are ready to use the navigation logic even in blueprints. I still need to optimize all systems a bit, but there is so much more to come that I decided not to focus on optimization just yet. While the entity system keeps the world alive, the real magic happens behind the scenes, because Infinite Horizons can now create multiple worlds in parallel, each one procedurally and unique. I can predefine a max world size and Infinite Horizons starts to generate a grid where each world is placed in one grid cell. As you probably can imagine, adjusting all systems including navigation, spawning and just everything to use unique local world coordinates instead of U world coordinates was just a real mess. But having multiple worlds in one level comes with the benefit of loading screen free world transitions, perfectly designed for the portal system. If a new world is created, the access subsystem automatically creates a portal which is the entry point of each Infinite Horizons world. 
It's also the access subsystem's purpose to link two portals together. If players now walk into the portal, they simply get teleported to the other portal's position, which is located in a different cell of the world grid. Travel between portals located in the same Infinite Horizons world will also be possible. To be able to see the new world through the portal, I had to simulate a player dummy at active portals. Manager classes now use the simulated positions instead of the real player position to generate content, which allows having multiple worlds simultaneously with extreme distances in between, while still use optimization methods like distance culling correctly. When a portal is active, a camera component at the other portal mirrors the player camera's movement and renders its view to the portal's plane. If we now also adjust the camera's field of view based on the player's distance to the portal and its size, it starts to look like as we are seeing the new world directly. And that brings us to what's next. I'm currently working on two major systems, the Environment Manager and the Time Manager. Together they will handle everything from dynamic weather, celestial movement to realistic day and night cycles. And maybe even time travel. But I don't want to promise too much since time travel systems are very complex to make but it's already working in the Celestial system, so be prepared. Once those systems are complete, I've decided to release a public demo of Infinite Horizons, a standalone build where you can freely explore and generate worlds, and experience all the systems in action. There is still a lot ahead, but this is just the beginning of what Infinite Horizons will become. Thanks for watching, until next time.